I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Once again, whenever I do a podcast with my good friend Tucker Max, and by the way, he was the first guest ever on my podcast, but as usual... We immediately went off plan and veered into wild and insane territory, which is a good thing. You want your podcast to be freeform and challenging and and challenge your own beliefs. Like the key to growth is challenging your own beliefs. And so the reason I say this is because this is not a political podcast, neither this episode nor the podcast itself, but... I have been wondering, and and a lot of people have been wondering, what is up with the extreme polarization on both sides? And we've seen we've seen it in every direction. So what I'm saying is, Tucker and I talk about this. Whatever side you're on, just leave that at the door. Just listen and think. It was interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to everybody. Lots of ideas thrown around and not really any solutions, which is a good thing. Sometimes we need solutions to grow from discourse. This was one of those discourses. Enjoy the podcast. This is part one. Part two is going to be about writing. I was having some problems. That's all we need now. Yeah, it's... (laughs) Like, uh, what was it? Last week was Verizon and T-Mobile and Chase were all attacked. Uh, And today, I guess, Google. uh, It just seems like there's nonstop attacks now. Because everyone lives on the internet now. (laughs) There's no other reality. Yeah, but you would figure Google of anybody would be able to, well, all of them should be able to avoid attacks because they're they're probably attacked all the time every day anyway. You would think. You know, it's interesting. There was um, an article uh, uh, on this economic site that the best way to handle a pandemic is just to keep your economy open and everybody yeah, <laughs> everybody economically healthy. And yep. I know you guys have been saying this. I've been saying this on all my podcasts. And this is, this is the proof, but you know, you can't, there's nothing anybody could do about it. Like I gave up trying to do something about it. You can't, you can't talk to people who are afraid. Yeah. But I, you know, I, even, I even know like top people working for Trump and they all agreed with me and they couldn't convince anybody. No. 
So no, like, like it, when once someone gets afraid, that's why every I mean, there's a reason that Machiavelli said it is better to be feared than loved as a leader, because yeah. once you are feared, you can control most people, not everyone, not people like you and me, but most people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of sad that. This, I mean, obviously, it's sad that all of these things are said that are happening, like the pandemic, the protests, all the other uh, collateral fatalities with the economic lockdowns and, and layoffs. But it's like you point out in your um, you know, lessons you've learned post, which we'll talk about, is that there's, you just have to take personal responsibility and live the best life you can and hope that reflects outwards. But there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, it's, I feel like right now what we're, what's going on is we're going through almost like a national mental breakdown, right? And, and in a lot of ways, I understand why. Like uh, so many of America's problems have been pushed off for so long and uh, it's time to pay the piper now, you know? And so like, dude, when I saw that video of that cop kneel on George Floyd's neck I like, I I wanted to go riot. Like I, I, I'm not a black man. Like my, I wrote a whole piece on how to deal with cops and like, and I talk about all of it. And then at the end I say, if you are black, nothing that I said applies to you because like, this is, this is obvious and has been obvious forever. Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor in the seventies and eighties did all kinds of comedy bits about white people, not believing black people. Like I don't, the white people, they say, oh, he's resisting arrest. And it's like, he had whole bits about it, man. Like, yeah. this has been the lived reality uh, of a large portion of our country for a long time, right? And so that, that's what, so that, that, it didn't take much to set that fire. And then you got to remember the kindling that that fire was set in is three months of everyone being essentially robbed of their autonomy, of their profession, and of their dignity with lockdowns. And so like, of course, if you set that match to that Tinder, shit is going to blow. And it did. Yeah. I mean, you can't like people thought, and it's so funny because I mean, you actually have one of your uh, lessons that you've learned where you, you, I forgot how you call described it, but you de-experted the experts. Yeah, Like there's been all this kind of worship of somebody just because they have an MD, we should listen to them about every single topic, including economics. And what I realized, I've I've probably had like six or seven doctors on the podcast. I've had economists, you know, billionaires, hedge fund managers, the whole thing. Everybody just knows their lane. (laughs) And they don't, and it's amazing how little well hold on about everything else. Sort of. I would tell you that I would not I, I, I would highly doubt that any epidemiologist is worth anything. At this point, I would tell you that I don't think there might be one or two who are kind of the rogue ones who know what they're talking about. I haven't found them yet if they exist, but epidemiologists uh, remind me of macroeconomists. They yeah. are complete bullshitters who use very sophisticated, high status looking voodoo to dress up a bunch of bullshit. That's who they are. It depends on how specialized. Like, I'm willing to believe they know how to mix one test tube with another. And no, 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 that's not what epidemiologists do, man. That's you're talking about MDs now. Epidemiologists are people who study disease spread, right? And but they don't know what they're talking about. They use bullshit model, made up models, right? So the so I so there you're right. Like the math models that was so easy to poke holes in with just basic knowledge of statistics and probability. But, you know, like I, one epidemiologist I had on, his job is just to see how do these cells attach to these cells? And then he can see how, you know, then they can start making guesses how the virus transmits. But that's what he was good at, is just to see which parts of these coronavirus cells are attaching to which parts of your cell. But then everything else, you know, was up for grabs. The infection rate, the fatality rate, how to contain it. Um, all the things that you actually expect from these guys, that he, he, we were all in the same boat. And then when you throw in like the mathematical models, they were so ridiculous. And you, and that's when, that's when I appreciated your lessons. I realized, you know what? There is no way to explain anything to anyone. 
So I'm just going to focus on what I do really well and not think about the outcomes of it. Hold, hold on. Uh, let's parse that statement. There's no way to explain anything to anyone when they are afraid or when their identity is being threatened. That is when humans retreat into primal selves, right? So if you're, if you're talking to a diehard patriot and you say something negative about America, they can't hear you because what they hear is a threat to their identity, right? Just like, and literally substitute diehard patriot with any group you want, Black Lives right. Matter, Republican, Democrat, conservative, Christian, I don't care. It's all this, the, this statement still stands. You can't talk to them about facts because facts don't matter to identity. Group tribal uh, association is the only thing that matters to identity. Do you think people have gotten more uh, afraid about their identities in the past 10, 20, No, 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 no. I, I don't think so. I think that hasn't changed. What I think has changed is, look, we, ha we had a mental health crisis in America, and then we isolated people. <laughs> I can't, seriously, that's like saying I had a bonfire going and then I dumped a bunch of gasoline on it. Like, yeah. I cannot imagine a worse situation. Like, pre COVID, that's just a January of 2020, right? Effectively pre COVID, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we, we still had m the diseases of uh, despair destroying America, loneliness, depression all those sorts of things, mass suicides, mass uh, 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 Oxycontin and uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, mass drug addiction and mostly prescription drug, uh, like uh, uh, prescription drugs. Uh, we had all kinds of mass mental health crises yeah. for a lot of reasons, right? But dude, I, like I don't think we're seeing anything different with identity. What we're seeing is um, identity, the fires of identity and mental health and fear are now feeding each other. It's sort of like, like you have one forest fire you can contain, but you get another one that hits it and they, they don't just double. They, they go up in magnitude, like waves are the same way, right? Ocean waves. A 20-foot wave hits a 20-foot wave and it becomes a 60-foot wave, right? We've had three waves hit all at once. And the reality is, man, like the chickens we hatched are now coming home to roost. Yeah. And you know, it's, it might even be not three waves, but four or five, six waves. We had Iran, you know, this, the, the potential for a World War III in early January. We had, then there was the impeachment. Well, hold stuff. on. What war? What, who, who's, who's Iran raging, waging a war against? Iran has no, like, they're not a viable military. January, they're, my kids wake me up and they're like, Dad, are we going to get drafted and I had, I had to look up what they were talking about That's just and then, the media stoking bullshit fear no i agree i agree but those each one of those created such hysteria. mental health crisis yes absolutely yeah. that the the media used to stoke fear and outrage to drive clicks to some extent now it's the only thing they do there is nothing i i, I struggle to find a media outlet that is not brazenly partisan Cosmopolitan.com. I swear to God, there's actually decent news. If you go to Cosmopolitan.com. Like the magazine? Yeah, like the magazine. The woman's magazine. The woman's magazine. Like today there was an article, what defund the police really means. It was- Well, it was no, hold on, actually, that's gaslighting. See, if they're saying it's anything other than defund the police, they're fucking gaslighting. That's bullshit. No, it, that's, it actually that, was, that, was- No, dude, that, that is, that's just not brazen propaganda. It's propaganda that's fooling you. I'll tell you what it did. It encouraged me- to actually look at the data. So I went to all the websites where here's the number of calls to the police, here's the percentage that were this, 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 here's the number of arrests. It actually got me thinking, which, which none of the main news outlets do. And I'm, I'm not even being like funny hold about on, this. Hold on, you, You're being clowned and you don't even know it, which is rare for you because you're very good at detecting cons. But like, there are two different discussions going on. Police reform is desperately necessary in this country unequivocally, and not just how cops treat black people. That is just the worst example of it. They, right. Black people just get it the worst. But go look up civil asset forfeiture, right? And go look up um, qualified immunity, which I was talking about long before this. And no. anyone who cared about liberty in this country was, which was almost nobody, right? And it took 
the most brazen sociopathic daylight murder to wake people up to this, which is great. Like the militarization of police is a horrible thing that should be changed. People who say defund the police do not care about that. They do not give a shit about that. People who say defund the police, they are trying in effect to destroy society. Those are the, what you want to call them, anarchists, you want to call them a death cult, whatever you want, or Marxist, whatever you want to call them. Anyone who tells you, I'm saying X, no, 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 I don't mean X when I say X, I actually mean Y, is fucking gaslighting you. That is absolute bullshit. And I would highly recommend you separating those two ideas in your mind. No, I, I agree with you. I think, I think there are two, quote unquote, defund the polices that mean two separate things. I don't think so. I think there's one. And, and the people that are, you think are actually mean police reform are useful idiots for the ones driving the, the kind of toxic divisiveness that I'm talking about. They're just useful idiots. For instance, I don't think the the police should be going around giving traffic tickets for you know or or, or arresting people. You know, you meant, you meant I, I'm with you. Uh, the, like the, like marijuana you know, arrest. Hundred percent, dude. Drug policy in America is 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 almost a human rights violation. Like we could be tried at the Hague for drug policy. I'm with I think you. you could probably go down and actually reduce. Let's call it this way: reduce budget on ridiculous police actions. And uh, you know, there's a there's certainly a role for police, but if, if I'm in favor of if, anything if, involving- If you believe that, you would say reform the police. All right, yeah. Or no, change I, the police or whatever. Yeah, because right? maybe, so, so what you're saying is defund means completely eliminate, uh, eliminate no, the budget. I'm saying people are telling you what they want to do. They're awful. They're evil. And then they're, 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 no, no, what I'm saying is not what I mean. I mean something. Whenever someone tells you what they say is not what they mean, they are by definition gaslighting. you. I grew up with gaslighters, man. I know it when I see it. This is gaslighting. As clear as fucking day, man. Just like Black Lives Matter is a, a, a trick movement, right? Like I am all for the idea of Black, Black Lives Matter. I am all for all the reforms uh, that we've talked about a hundred percent. You, I don't know how you could be a self-respecting human and not be in favor of that. But the, if you go go look at the roots of the Black Lives Matter movement, and you go look at the people who founded it, and it is these are not people who care about police reform. These are not people who care about Black lives. These are dyed-in-the-wool Marxists who are trying to essentially lay the foundation to overthrow the American system. And this is not a conspiracy theory. You find videos of them talking about it openly. No, no, I, I agree. I've done uh, podcasts about this. So I was talking to one guy, is the um, Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams, African-American, who's in the police for 22 years. And he was even telling me there were, they, there were what you were just saying, there's, there's other groups infiltrating these, you know, these protests. They're not peaceful protesters. They're violent. Like he was describing their, you know, and you've probably seen the news, the, the lawyers who threw Molotov cocktails at, at police cars. Yeah, yeah. And, and he said that he, he reminded me, I, I thought, I didn't know this. Apparently it's not easy to make a Molotov cocktail. Like you have to really plan it. Yeah, and, because you can blow up. It's real bad. You get real messed up if you do it wrong. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's and then, but what, what is interesting to me is there's not been any investigations of this. Like there's nothing in the, like obviously these people are there Hold on. No one's investigating Not, them. It's no just investigations like no is a very different thing than you don't hear about in the news. All right, yeah, go ahead. The reason you don't hear about it in the news is because most news is so far left that they are ideologically captured by, uh, let's just call it, for, for lack of a better term, they, you know what? They're ideologically captured by what I, by why, what I call wokeism now. It's a new religion, yeah. wokeism. And it encompasses a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff. But it is literally, the left has been so bereft of religion for so long. It, their religion used to be global uh, uh, climate change or global warming. And they try to change the climate change because they realize, oh, the earth is actually not getting that much warmer. In fact, the last couple of years it started to cool, but whatever. So like, it is absolutely a religion. And if you didn't think that, then the pictures of white people both washing the feet of black people and uh, literally lashing themselves on the back. 
could be whole that you need to be like, oh, wow, this is really fucked up. It yeah. is. Like a religion that calls itself a religion is like, okay, cool, we can deal with it. But I don't even think wokeism, it, the problem with wokeism is that it is, um, it is shame, guilt and shame without the possibility of repentance, right? There is no forgiveness in it, which makes right. it a death cult. It is, yeah. I'm, guys, I, like, I know I sound like a, cra- like a little bit like a crazy person. I'm with you. I'm just telling no, no, you it, right it, now, I'm yeah. telling you right now, that right now, an ideological battle for the soul of America is going on. If you don't realize it, then you're probably either not paying attention or a useful idiot for one of the two sides. No, I 100% agree. I mean, you look at every single day. You, it, it used to be like maybe once a month, somebody would get quote unquote canceled for, for whatever reason. And, and usually a reason I wouldn't agree with, but whatever. Now it's like every day there's lists, reams of reporters, professors, comedians, actors, politicians. People make a, a wrong, J.K. Rowling did the wrong like on Twitter and like they started burning her no, books. J- no, no, J.K. Rowling committed the cardinal sin of saying that women are not men. Well, you know, you know how it started though. <laughs> Seriously. She's like, oh, you mean gender exists? And then people freaked the fuck I didn't disrespect trans people, none of that. Just said, no, gender actually exists. There are women and there are men. Yeah, but you you know, you know what you know what triggered her to write that though? She liked uh, somebody who said that on Twitter. Right. She liked the tweet. Yeah. And then they all were throwing at her. So, so but, but you she understand wrote the post. cancel culture is all I say this not literally, more figuratively. It's basically all bullshit. Because of it, 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 all you have to do is be like, no, fuck you. That's not how it works. Yeah. Like, I, like, guys, I was the canary in the coal mine for so much of this. Like, I, yeah, I was one of the you first. You were canceled 15 years ago. Dude, seriously, 10 years ago, right? Like, try to, and I, I, in fact, I was the one who orchestrated it for, for press and media for my movie. I created it. Right. Right? I know exactly how this works. All you have to do is be like, fuck you, no. Right? It's not that. Now, yes, of course, there are consequences. Some people get fired. I get it, et cetera. But I almost hope the cancel canceling speeds up because I, I we need to develop societal immune systems to this and learn to be like, oh, someone's squawking about canceling. We need to then ignore them and ostracize that, that person. That is the person who has to go, not the person they're trying to cancel. I agree because directly confronting it is, is not going to do anything. It's got to be- Because you've accepted their frame. You understand this, Jay. As soon as someone says- we cancel that person, right. and then you argue about them being canceled, then you've lost. The way to break their frame is you cancel someone else, you try to cancel someone else, you are canceled. Yeah. Stops it. Well, so, you know, I want to, I want to, um, your, your wokeism quote is interesting. So I um, wrote something that's, uh, this is, uh, let me describe what I think is the definition of a cult. So specialized vocabulary, mm-hmm. which wokeism definitely has, just the oh, word yeah. woke is specialized vocabulary. Levels of achievement. So there's obviously, course, you know, intersectionalism course. is all about, you know, how strong your voice is based on, you know, these, these other factors. Uh, okay, let me ask you, a third part of a cult. It's usually a sacred text. Mm-hmm. So what would White that be? fragility. For, oh, yeah, right now. That's the yeah. number one book on Amazon, right? Where, yeah, okay. That book um, is so bad, it's funny. If uh, I'd written a parody, I couldn't have made it worse than that. Oh, my God. You should write a parody. But okay, I'll, no. a charismatic leader. You can't parody that. Yes, <laughs> charismatic leader. They don't have a charismatic leader. What they have is a martyr. Yeah, in this particular case. But George even before Floyd. that. Do you, well, he's the, he's the one who sparked, like, before that, who was the charismatic no, leader? Maybe AOC. She's charismatic. She's a leader. Yeah, but wokeism existed before her, although she, is, she does fit the definition of a charismatic leader. You're right about that. Yeah. Ex- expulsion of apostates, which is cancel culture. Oh, of course, absolutely. Uh, aggression against near believers, which is interesting because yes. a, lot of, uh, that, that, a lot of alt-left doesn't like Biden, for instance. Oh, yeah, hate him. Hate his guts. Oh, if you aren't a complete... Yes, that's 100%. What you described is not a cult, though. What you just described is a fundamentalist religion, which is what wokeism is. Yeah, and then the, the final thing is arcane rituals, which I guess there's lots of different... Feet washing, all of that yeah. bullshit, all the mimetic imitation they do. No, it's a fundamentalist religion. It's fundamentalism is what it is at its core. It's left, it's, it is a leftist fundamentalism that has replaced communism. So my, my fear and, and 
you know, I'll ask you about, there, there's two aspects to this, but my fear is that there's no stopping this. The dam has broken and, no, you know. you're right. It, it can't be. It, yeah. it, it, like, it has to play itself out, I should say. But we're not going back. The, you, the genie is out of the bottle now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Once, once, once they had 40 million layoffs and then George Floyd, and now you're seeing, you know, as we're talking, Google is down. Uh, you know, there's all these cyber attacks. There was some sort of nuclear explosion no, I, I, I'm or actually, leak last I'm night. actually super happy it happened. I, I, who knows, right? But I think it happening faster is better, weirdly. Yeah, it's a good point about, um, uh, it's almost like a weird kind of herd immunity. We can develop the immune systems quicker. Yeah, yeah, we can, no, seriously, we can develop the immune systems quicker. If this had been allowed to fester for more decades, um, it might have been way worse when it eventually broke. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match. Up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like The key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. 
Dan Brown on writing or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, it's interesting. I spoke to, this is years ago, I spoke to Nassim Taleb and I told him, it's right after Anti-Fragile came out and I know you're, you're friends with Nassim and uh, I'm- His book, his book came out today. His, oh, I didn't uh, know that. That he did with us, yeah. It, it's like the statistical consequences of fat tales. It's a deeply mathematical book. It's not oh, I've a- gotta get it. <laughs> you'll love it, you will, because you know math, you'll love it. Yeah. So, so, so I, I had him on my podcast for Anti-Fragile and I said to him, you know, I'm worried about my personal anti-fragility because I haven't been to a doctor since I was 17. And uh, I'm worried once I actually get sick from something that I'm just going to like completely collapse. Like that's it. I'm dead. And he, he, his suggestion, which I think was only half in jest was like, maybe I should just try poisoning myself a little bit each day, <laughs> which is not a bad, not a bad view of things. Like he's described how he walks on, you know, he, whatever he can, he doesn't walk on the sidewalk. He walks on grass and, you know, to hurt his feet a little bit. And uh, it, was, it, it was interesting, but I'm always worried you know, as a society, obviously we have economic anti-fragility, but we also have this deep cultural uh, fragility. I mean, right now. Oh, we did, and COVID exposed it, which is actually a good thing. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to that optimism. I haven't taken that view until you just said that, but no, it no, makes sense. Hold on, I, I'm not saying everything's gonna turn out well. Like it, it's up in the air right now, uh, and I, like I said, there's a battle going on, and when the battle's going on, the who knows is gonna what's gonna who's gonna win. I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty, it's 2020. Uh, I'll be pretty shocked if America, as we know it, exists as a singular nation, maximum seven years. Um, I, I think almost certainly we're going to start seeing uh, separatist. I mean, look, you already see it, okay? Like the, the uh, Occupy Wall Street was, was the canary in the coal mine. And then now you have Oh, Chaz in Seattle. These are going to keep going. These are the kooks who don't do it right. But the idea of separatism was unthinkable in America even five years ago. And now you had multiple states forming coalitions to resist federal government orders about coronavirus in the last three months, right? I would not shock me if California was the first to go which would be hilarious because they are the most mismanaged, arguably the most mismanaged state in America. And I could see them collapsing. Like I could see that I, if, if California is separated, even to some extent, and it is doing it now with its laws, it will end up, because it is fully captured by fundamentalist wokeism, it will destroy itself. Unequivocally, absolutely. All the, it will play out almost like Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> like I'm no Ayn Rand fan. But I like I could see if the rest of America holds it together, that that it plays out like Atlas Shrugged, and everyone you already see Elon Musk is already he just bought a bunch of land in Austin, right? That everyone's moving, like everyone is leaving California and New York right now, and not an accident. In the past two days, I have just I have snapshotted at least thirty of my Facebook friends who who have specifically said. 
well, after 27 years of living in New York City, uh, we just packed up and- We're leaving. Yeah, we're leaving. And I can't, I've been snapshotting because it's, it's such a rare thing to have like 30 people all of a sudden just like up and move. Dude, 10X. The moving companies, 10X exodus yeah. from New York. 10X. It used to be 50 people a month leaving New York, like for the average whatever moving company. And now it's 500 well, think, think about it. When we first got on this call, I would mention I'm, I'm in Florida right now. I rented this place sight unseen. You know why I did it sight unseen? Because the real estate agent, every single hour, we were losing places. People were bidding 50% up on rents from New York City to move to yeah. Florida. The yeah. real, it's not like they were trying to sell us. You know how real estate agents like they're yeah, trying right, to game you like, you better act fast. She, this real estate was just like, look, I don't know what I... I can do. I can't help you anymore. <laughs> like it's, they're all gone now. You, but we just called you yesterday. No, I'm sorry. They're all rented. There's, I, I'm not trying to negotiate. They already were rented for 50% <laughs> higher uh, and already at ridiculous prices. Uh, so we just took this one place that was available and there was no negotiating. We signed a year of lease sight unseen and, and came down here. I mean, I would have come to Texas, but that's just me. <laughs> I, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was, I was debating between Austin and Miami. I decided it's a little easier for my kids to get uh, to Miami. So I, I, that's why I picked it. Is. It is. It is. I get it. So yeah. when well, um, you're a New York Jew, you have to go to Florida. It's like a rule. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, the homeland is here. Right, so Fort Lauderdale is like uh, where, where Israel really should have been. So seriously, wouldn't that have been amazing if we relocated Israel in America or in Cuba? God, you know, I, God how I different once, the world would be. I once brought this up at a, I went, I was at some random networking event where it was like me and various billionaires and governors. I don't even know why I was invited to this. And I, for some reason, just blurted out, like they should have just made Montana Israel. Like, why did we put it in the middle of the Middle East? And everyone got so upset at me. Like, uh, <laughs> That's such but, a James thing to do. <laughs> I, was, I, I honestly, though, like so many like prominent people got upset at me that I was a little, I embarrassed the host of the dinner who had, had invited me. So I felt bad about that. But why couldn't we have brought all these scientists? And Dude, you know, what's so funny is that right now that opportunity is presenting itself to the world. If yeah. any country were to open up like I'm like whatever the the square mileage of of uh, Hong Kong is it's it's something obnoxiously small 50 square miles or something or the way less than that if they're like hey everyone from Hong Kong we're going to we got a uh, whatever you call it uh, a charter city same rules as Hong Kong pre China uh yeah, you know like uh, you, you bring whatever you want we'll distribute the find some fair way to distribute the land and then like they would immediately uh, uh, within 10, 15 years max, they, it would be one of the most, one of the major cities in America. Uh, sorry, yeah. in the world. In the world. Easily. I, Anyone I think that, could do, Honduras could do it. Anyone could do this. Yeah. I think if I, Costa Rica did it, I would, be, I, man, I'd, I'd buy shares in the Costa Rican stock market. I'd be like, oh, they're going, they're going to go nuts. Yeah. And unfortunately, zero people will do it. Basically, zero people right now are going to end up doing the right thing for a long time. Well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see, man. They're, they're not, not everyone's captured by the woke virus. You know, not everyone's fundamentalist wokest. Uh, woke I, think, I think we're finally starting to see Americans wake up to what I was. I was a little early, and I knew I saw this coming, and I told people, and no one listened to me, and it's like, okay, I'm too early. Um, now people are starting to wake up, and they're starting to understand, oh, wow. Look at this. Like, uh, and I get why three years ago, five years ago, maybe if you're fat and happy that you're not going to listen to the alarmist, right? Now, now people are like serious people are starting to wake up and be like, oh, oh, this is not right. This is way wrong. Um, and so we're going to see what happens. I, I, think, I think the wokists are going to be shocked once the, the, American, the American bear wakes up. You know, it's, it's interesting though, because you can't like, so th this was a few months ago, like maybe March and my wife had lived in Africa for years and she took, when she was there, she took hydroxychloroquine every single day and all right. her kids did as a prophylaxis against right. It's been malaria. around 50 years. <laughs> right. It's been around 50 years. And so I tweeted something like that and someone I know who's, 
intelligent guy, uh, you know, well-known person started texting me saying, listen, you can't say that. This is, you know, that's going to affect the election. And I'm like, but it's going to save lives potentially. I mean, I don't know anything. I'm not claiming to be a doctor. I, I always say, go to your doctor. And, um, and, and I, but I asked this person, though, what do you, you know, anyway, it doesn't matter specifically, but it just surprised me the range of people who are willing to sacrifice some aspects of being a good person for some other weird, obscure goal. Really? Yeah. It shocks you how many people will, are, are willing to be sheep captured by someone else's ideology and will no. sacrifice whatever dignity or self-respect they have for shreds of power or scraps from the table? Really? I guess not in the general case when you put it that way, <laughs> but in the specific, I was surprised at how many people I knew specifically that, yeah. that I've known for 20 years that were, that were under that spell. When, some, when, like, when I was just making an innocent tweet about something that could save lives, but because the president of the United States had previously spoken about it, it became a political issue as opposed to a health issue. Yeah. No, uh, dude, uh, like tr Trump is both, he's, he's like his own weird sort of like uh, thing. Um, uh, look, I, here's, I said people are starting to wake up. Starting is the operative word there. Uh, I would say if, I'm just going to make up numbers. If 0.01% of people were awake in January of this year, then maybe 1% or 2% are awake now. Most people are still sheep who do nothing other than engage in mimetic competition, meaning that they imitate the monkeys that they see higher on the status bar than they are. And I mean monkeys, all of us, right? Like we're all monkeys, right? I mean, it's just funny though how, how it's not any one group that is at fault no, because Amer America doesn't... Everybody. <laughs> James, the American story doesn't exist anymore. It has broken. Right. The American story at the beginning had fundamental flaws. Slavery. We go, I mean, go across the, the, the sort of spectrum. But the story was so compelling. And combined with the uh, natural resources and geography of America, combined with the best story ever told for a nation state, created the greatest nation in the history of the world. That story uh, broke. And I don't know the exact day, and I don't know exactly what, but it was little pieces here and there and here and there, and eventually it broke. That is the core reason why we have all these problems is because all these other counter narratives are better when they're facing essentially no opposition right now. No, there is no, think about it, man. What is the unifying, and I don't mean unifying of all people. I just mean unifying of the people who aren't the toxic, fundamentalist, wokists, or whatever other fringe groups around them, like Antifa is, I mean, they're, they're part of them. So what's the, what fundamental story do you unify under, right? Like, I, it doesn't exist. The American story is broken. Nothing has yet replaced it. Right, so... But I would still unify under that story. Maybe it's an imaginary story. It's essentially the, the choose yourself story, which is that I have my own personal freedom. James, 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 most people are sheep. Stop it, man. You know this. No, but you I know, I know this. So it's not it's not unifying, but it should that's what I feel should be unifying, but it's not. Yeah, well, I, if you want to live in the world of shoulds, it's good that place is called heaven. I'll be happy yes, to kill I, you if you I, want. You can go live there, right? Down here on earth. We have I to agree. live in reality. <laughs> I agree. In fact, that's always been the benefit of being outside the normal world because then that's why you're rich and take famous. advantage. Is because you 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 think that way, and, and that's why I am, and most people aren't. And take that's take it. advantage maybe is a harsh word, but it's how you can it, by stepping outside the line. Everybody's standing in line, but if you step out the line, you realize, oh, there wasn't really a line in the first place. I didn't. Yeah. There wasn't a teacher making the line. I could step out any time and just go where I want to go. Yes. That, that has been a positive story in my life for a long time and, and in your life. But now it's being, um, there's sort of, I don't know how to describe it. There's like an attempted punishment of that story. Oh, of course, because that story is antithetical to fundamentalist wokeism. Like, listen, I, I, I was alive. I saw the shift. I, I saw the shift from fundamentalist Christianity to fundamentalist wokeism. 
it was fucking crazy, man. And it happened in like a three-year period. It was like, and it was concurrent with me. When I started writing, it, it was 2001-ish. And like the people who hated me and criticized me were basically all fundamentalist Christians or devotees of that style mm -hmm. of authoritarian thinking. By the time I retired, 10 years later, which was 2012, all of the critical people were fundamentalist wokeists. There were no more left. I saw the transition. I lived it, right? The, I'm, I'm convinced in our society, there is a, like, you know, like in, in the universe, there's a conservation of energy. Energy can't be destroyed or created, only uh, shifted. I'm convinced that there is a conservation of authoritarian uh, ideology and that there are certain people who are just lust for power over others and want that power in an ideological way, right? And the, 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 the people didn't shift. Like, I can't think of an example of someone who was like fundamentalist Christian preacher and now is an Antifa leader, right? But, but the, uh, the people who grew up in America in a certain time period who had that inclination went into fundamentalist religion, whether it was Catholic or whoever else, just they picked one of them, right? And then as society shifted and norms shifted, the people who had those, that inclination didn't go into religion anymore. They went to the left and they went to the American academies and they studied, you know, all the fucking bullshit, uh, uh, gender uh, uh, nonsense and all that Marxist bullshit. And so they're all over there now, right? And so uh, America has always had to fight that war, right? The problem is, here's the problem. When the right are the fundamentalists in a free country, you can control them pretty easily, right? And I don't want to paint America as a utopia the last 200 years because God knows it isn't. Right. But compared to everyone else, it was way better because we had founders who set a real clear frame and a lot of people who supported that frame. And then the people trying to essentially break it were, were fundamentalist Christian who were wrapped up with the fabric of society, right? So it was like they were easier to control because they were in power. When the left has power, left, right fundamentalism is authoritarianism. Left fundamentalism is mass murder, right? That's communism. That's Marxism. We, saw, we played that experiment in the 20th century, and we see what happens with that. Tens of millions of people die right? That's, it is the same ideology. Make no mistake about it, man. And, and, and that shift happened. And now that's, those are the people we have to fight. The problem is they aren't abroad and they don't, they, they aren't another country. The enemy is now us. It is people in America. I, this is why we're good. This country is going to break up, man. I'm telling you in some shape or form. The, all, the best one can do is fight for your own kind of personal See, I, integrity. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. You're okay. right. No, hold on. I, I shouldn't say disagree. Um, yes. And you can, all change starts at home, all of that sort of stuff. Like I'm very uh, Buddhist in that sense. Right. But I disagree that you cannot affect others. I, I feel like right now the dumb, we have, an amazing story, the story of America, that uh, because of its fundamental flaws that were never really worked out, that we had to fight multiple wars over, right? Like we fought a war over slavery. It wasn't an actual uh, pitched battle, but we fought another war over women's suffrage. We fought, mul we fought multiple, we fought civil rights war. Like there, these are wars that were fought in America, ideological or physical wars uh, based on the flaws. But the system, the system itself had too many fundamental flaws, right? And so until a new story comes along that can replace that, this country, we are going to circle the drain and going to break up. And then each little enclave will have its own story and succeed or fail on its own, right? But there is no story to counter. It's not that wokeism is compelling. It is only compelling to people who are either useful idiots or sociopaths, right? Or, or people who have deep emotional issues 
They hate their parents. Like you go look at the Antifa, Antifa people. If you can't watch one video, I tell you exactly what's going on. They're all skinny, scrawny white kids. Every single one of them. And they're all 18 to 26 because right. they all hate their parents. Almost all of them come from places that have money. But parents were lawyers or doctors, didn't pay attention to them. They had terrible childhoods. There's no narrative for that sort of trauma in our society. So they find this ideology that supports the idea that their parents are terrible. So they join it. And, and I get it. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't empathize with them. I don't support them. I intellectually understand what's going on, right? Because I was that age too. And I understand exactly, they don't understand it, right? But they, they, you know why most of those kids are joining that? Because there's no other story. There's no other story that's compelling to them that they've actually seen works. Because to them, the American story is this, but they live over here, right? Same with black, black people the same way. Ask any black person, here's the American story. What was your experience like there? It wasn't like that. Right. And so, so you're saying both these groups you've described feel betrayed by the American story and... And, and the people in their lives, both. Right. Right. So there's not going to be a moment of personal courage that is going to take them to form their own story. They still have to find an... In How many people do you know that form stories of, of their lives? Even just of their own lives. Forget lives for others. Right. Almost so none. I know I think that's a great point. And I think I think I was surprised how few people I knew that were like that. And I've only just, you know, so I always thought everybody that I knew was kind of was like that. And oh. I was disappointed during these past, let's call it four or five months. Wouldn't that be great, man, if we were all like that? No. <laughs> if we were like that, we wouldn't need organized uh large scale governments. That we we be fine with small scale scale city state type things, which honestly I feel like probably if we could get there peacefully, that um, smaller scale city type states organized into larger scale federations, um, like an older school European system without the feudalism and all the bullshit, the baggage of Europe, that would work really well, uh, because I think people are designed to operate on small scale systems, right? Uh, Large-scale systems have benefits, but the problem is large-scale systems have big costs. And, and the world, especially America, has been paying the costs of large-scale bureaucratic systems. Think about this, man. Think about the history of the 20th century. Industrialization in the late 18th century led to corporatism and bureaucracy in the 20th century, which led to war has been with us forever. We haven't had 100 million people die ever. Not even the Black Plague was even close to that. Why? Because mass killing on uh, or mass true corporate style industrial level mass killing was possible, right? You can kill 10 million. How would, how would Charlemagne kill 10 million people? <laughs> this is not possible, man. It doesn't matter how bloody or terrible he was. Stalin, shit, man, snap of his fingers. Let's starve some people. It's like no problem, right? Humans are not designed to operate at that level. Humans are designed to operate at a smaller scale. The ideal situation is where certain systems operate a large scale, like maybe some trade and some other things, but most decisions are made locally, like for people, right? I don't see how we get there peacefully, though, because the sociopaths in charge would never allow that, because that means they're not in charge anymore. Unless, unless you get there in some authoritarian way. So for instance, there are a completely controlled city that I have to apply for. And then once I'm in the system, I'm in the system. Like you make a reservation, go to the grocery store. Tell me where, what country is giving up that land? Uh, well, I'm worried that could get mandated in the U.S. <laughs> no, no. Anything mandated in the U.S. would be like, uh, would be a, no, no, nothing. That's not small scale, dude. That's large scale. That's, that's, then, then you start talking about world government shit and all this crazy stuff. Like the thing I'm most worried about, which actually may be the path, is that like, think about this. So the argument against large scale attempts to re-engineer society has been that every time we do that, it leads to mass death, right? Because it did. Right. That's what I'm saying will happen. Okay. You're right. Except here's the thing. Well, most of the dumbass intellectuals who, who, you know, like write their nonsense fucking uh, uh, 
think pieces to each other and all the high-end rags are all now being like, wait, we just shut down the economy for three months and nothing bad happened. And so now the idea is, oh, we can just engineer anything we want. Again, just like wokeism has to play itself out, I think that those ideas still have to play themselves out. And yeah. I think what we're going to see, the only path there is when people finally realize that government is filled with power-hungry, broken, socio, toxic sociopaths, for the most part. And I don't mean the low levels at your DMV. I mean the motherfuckers way up, up top who really pull the levers. And that, that um, they are utterly unreliable and they have sold out your future. And they have. This is not like an arguable thing. Maybe then. The problem is then it be, erupts in violence, which is what we're seeing, a small-scale version of that right now. We're seeing that. Look at, and from a technology point of view, look at the theory behind contact tracing. So contact tracing is not a new story. Like they right. did it in Spanish flu. They've done another pa pandemic. It's not necessary. It's, it's a good intentioned idea, but everybody with an iPhone, for instance, has downloaded the latest iOS update. In there was software to enable contact tracing. And what happens is, here's a worst case scenario. I pass a stranger on the street. That person has coronavirus. A contact tracer is able to contact me and said, oh, you, we noticed through your phones, you pass someone on the street. We know where you are right now. You need to come in immediately for a test. And if I don't, the worst case is, well, then I'm arrested. I'm tested if I have it, but I don't want to quarantine. Oh, but here we've provided for an excellent hotel room for you in our forced quarantine center. You'll just have to stay 14 days. Now extrapolate that out further. The phone can also hear what you say. If I say something, let's say against the people in charge, the exact same contact tracing software can be put into place. I, I'm with you, dude. Oh, so-and-so was right next to me. They need to be quarantined for their political beliefs and so, until we can determine where they stand, that they're not a threat to society. Like um, I, somebody just wrote, a, a, somebody I knew actually uh, wrote an op-ed about freedom of speech and it would have been a normal freedom of speech article except for good thing the New York Times fired that editor for, uh, who let a Republican senator do an op-ed because uh, sometimes speech does need to be limited. And the whole point of the column, this is a person who runs a free speech organization that's a well-known organization. The whole point of the column was that you got to protect freedom of speech and then she's justifying not protecting it. Um, this, that combined with technology now is a, da is a dangerous path. Uh, dude, I'm with you. I'm saying like this poison is going to have to work itself out of the system. And the only question is, does the poison, it's sort of like when, when someone's sick. Do yeah. you get well or does the poison win? Does the no. sickness win? I, I like this way of, of viewing it, which I, haven't, which I haven't viewed it in that way before. That This is sort of a... Uh, the only antidote, man, the only antidote, the only antidote. We're humans. We live in the world of story. Like everything about everything for us is story. Right? Like, and I mean that almost literally, you know? Uh, the only antidote are better stories. So, so it's interesting because you, you pointed out the book, White Fragility, and I saw a review of it some, I haven't read the book, but I saw a review of it somewhere that quoted some outlandish passages from it. But it's so bad, I'm telling you, you can't parody it. Like any parody of it, it you could find it in there. Seriously, it's the worst. Yeah, so, so what do you think is, I mean, you're in the publishing business. What do you think is a story that, that could rise up right now? I don't think right there now? is. now? No, nothing could rise up right yeah. now. People, like, people have not suffered enough and there aren't enough people awake. So what's, what, what's the story of the next 365 days? And you, know, you, you and I both see this from a, a publishing perspective. We know the stories that are There's no way to tell a story about a year from now because uh, there is an inflection point on November 6th or whatever it is. Yeah. Like, the American story fundamentally changes based on who wins. Fundamentally changes. Uh, I'm, not e I'm not even dumb enough to think I can predict exactly how, because I can't. I can just tell you that I, I know for sure two things. Th th we will go in drastically different directions depending on whether it's Trump or Biden. I'm not convinced Biden's even going to be the nominee. Different discussion. I, I'm not but, convinced but, either of them are going to be the nominee. I know Trump's def, Trump, Trump's not quitting. That's bullshit. Like all, right. come on, all the Trump's mad and pissed off and 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 
and uh, losing his mind. We've seen four years of those stories. Do yeah. we really still believe them? No, right, right. of course not. They're bullshit, right? That is just gaslighting. Okay, the country will go in drastically different directions. I don't think either side's going to accept the other one winning. I don't think Trump's people are going to accept a... Uh, I, I, think, I think Hillary Clinton's going to swoop in and take the nominee. That's just me. I could be wrong. I don't think it's Biden. But whatever. They won't accept the dom- Democratic nominee. And the, dem- and, and the woke left, the, the wokists, will definitely not accept... And there's plenty of never-Trumpers and people with Trump derangement syndrome who don't consider themselves wokists, although really they're kind of in the, their tangential camps in a lot of ways. Because they haven't quite woken up yet. They, it, it, so you're right, dude. There's so many people have Trump derangement syndrome. That's like, I hate Trump, but I can at least look at him objectively. They can't. It's like they've lost their mind. It's a different religion, the anti-Trump religion. But neither side's going to accept it. And so, uh, but the consequences of that are going to be severe. So, how do you personally protect yourself and your family? Yeah. Both. In well, terms so number of- one, I live in Texas. Right? No, I'm, de- I'm not fucking around, dude. There's a reason yeah, I'm not in Texas. I agree with you. So Texas has, there are three energy grids in America. West, East, Texas. Right? And Texas, is, if there is a state that is going to hold out and can, it is Texas. Right? Uh, they're absolutely unequivocally, uh, you can make good arguments for other states. The best arguments are for Texas. Uh, and so number one. Number two, Veronica and I are already, we're about to close on a ranch. It's going to be, we're looking at a couple, 60 to 100 acres right outside Austin. And like, we're not going off the grid or any nonsense like that. But we're definitely going to start, um, call it homesteading. Although without all the weirdness that comes with that, right? Like we're going to have a few cows. We're going to have chickens. We're going to like, uh, uh, look at modern agrarianism. I think that is a massive movement. Uh, and it, it was big before coronavirus. It's overwhelming now. And uh, we're also going to look at, um, I have at least two uh, friends of ours, families, couples with kids who we're probably going to sell a, like, an, like an acre or two a piece and they're going to build their house. We're going to build like our own, call it like a subdivision with a farm. There's not really a name for what this is, uh, but we're going to build our own little community. Uh, and we're part of America. We're going to follow all the laws. We're using electricity. Like we're not weirdos, right? But we also are deeply insulated from most of the shocks, right? I think, I'll tell you, I mean, it, it, America is going to shift fundamentally and we're, we're going to have to pick sides. I don't know if it's just going to be two sides. I don't think it's Republican, Democrat. I think the Democratic Party is going to break up because they are being pulled by the wokest left and that is not indicative of the party. So when I say people are going to have to pick a side, there might be 10 sides. I don't know what they are, but people are going to have to pick. The world has fundamentally shifted. It's not going back. You know, so many people get sucked into the argument. And I think it's also a challenge to not necessarily take a side. You know, what do you mean? You said, you said, you said earlier, it's, it's possible to affect change or it's, or you shouldn't think that you can't affect things. But the reality is you, you really can't, you kind of have to wait and let the story play out also. Like you're or not you make going to the change. story, or you write the story, or you, or write, you write the, the story. story. But that's not happening right now. You're, like, you're right. Like if someone told me, Tucker, you got to pick a side right now. I would tell you, there's no side I'm picking. Right. Because what side am I picking? I'm not picking Trump. I'm definitely not picking the wokists. I'm not picking the fundamentalist Christians. I'm not picking. You're not going out in the streets and yelling at people. You're not going on Twitter and right. yelling. I'm at not people. picking Antifa. I'm not picking the people who, who uh, you know, who are, uh, don't think black lives matter. I'm not picking any of this. Like the stories that are out there right now all suck. And America as a story isn't really pickable anymore. No, it's who, true. Like, who I is go, that? What is that now? I go on Twitter and it really, I get this enormous metaphor for it. This is like everybody has radiation sickness and they're just spitting blood on Twitter. <laughs> yes. And that's exactly, that's and there's no reason metaphor. to be it. It's yeah. a perfect metaphor, dude. Hunter, it's why I, I post lessons learned and I never make them applicable to a specific moment in time. And it's so funny, man, because like I'll post something about responsibility, right? It's something I learned about responsibility. And then whatever camp the person is will project the other side 
onto whatever negative thing they can interpret. So like the Trumpers will be like, yeah, that's right. Like Trump takes responsibility and Biden doesn't or whatever. And the, the wokest will say, yeah, that's right. Like Trump doesn't take responsibility for anything or wh- whatever. They all read. It's, I feel like Forrest Gump, man. You know, like, remember like, for, like everyone read Forrest Gump and all the liberals thought it was a liberal book and the conservatives thought it was a conservative book and everyone right. read their own shit into it. I, I, I feel like the same way. I, no one speaks for me right now. There is no group right now that I feel like, and I'm not talking about fuck libertarians, fucking nonsense. Those goddamn losers had the absolute opportunity to own this moment. And they're such fucking losers that they missed it. Because as a belief system, that's the most American. Right. But they're just fucking losers. But And the, the problem there is I think they, buy, they still buy into the story that you need to be a party instead of... Yes, just- and they're just dorks. All of them are dorks. And they, they will not accept realities, both of, of, of like humans, human nature, and physical realities. Oh, you got to pay to be on a road. And it's, shut the fuck up, man. This is like, what century are you living in? The, the, the pure uh, uh, Mises, Hayek, libertarian state, that ship fucking sailed 70 years ago. Actually, it probably sailed 100 years ago. World War I ended that. It's over. The American bureaucratic state was then absolutely uh, uh, set. That's it. And so, like, stop arguing about a, his, a reality that can't exist anymore. Look where we are. They missed the boat. And I have seen nobody in the Tea Party are cranks. And, like, Alex Jones and all those people are cranks. And so it's like there's nobody... There doesn't exist a free, the intellectual dark web or a bunch of fucking nerds. Seriously, as much as I love some of those guys, Eric Weinstein and Dave Rubin, and they're great dudes, they're they're just complete nerds who keep arguing in the old frames and won't see the new ones. No one one that I have ever seen gets it. I I agree. It's it's interesting you say that about those guys because I like those guys and I'm I like friends them with them. And they're great you, dudes. You they have great arguments, yeah. but they're still arguing in the old frames. Right. And you're, you're right. They're not, they're not telling a new story. I, I feel like there was like a three year period where their story was kind of rising up a little bit, but it just wasn't compelling enough. It's and there was not compelling a little bit because of they whine. They're whiny bitches. Why aren't you respecting us? Why isn't the, I remember when the left cared about this and but that fucking ship sailed, dude, stop whining. Right. It's your earlier point. You can't, you can't defend or complain. You're giving the other the people you're complaining against status and they don't quite get that. Right. When two ideas collide, the stronger frame wins and the older frame is eaten and the weaker frame is broken. And that's it. There is no, there is no, that's it. And they, their frames they have great arguments. They have really poor frames. Think about what they called the movement. Intellectual, dumb, you've lost most of America. Dark, which is obviously negative, And web, which has another negative connotation. We're nerds in the corner. Like uh, caught, uh, tangled together. What, what are you doing, man? Hey. What are you doing? So why don't, well, it seems like maybe you should think about what the story is that, that you want to say that could be said. I'm not sure. I, I got to be honest, James. I'm not sure what it is, man. I'm, I'm yeah. really, try, I don't have, I wish I could end the podcast on a flurry of here's my new story. Because, I don't, I don't because know everything has been so anti. Everybody is anti yes. something. That's no, no anti is ever a story. That's not right. a story. And that's, that's a little bit the problem with uh, Biden, I guess, is that people aren't really for him. You know, you look at every poll. Nobody They're really likes Trump. him that much. No, no one likes him. It's like all the women when uh, that woman came out and accused Biden of sexual assault or whatever. And all these women were like, we believe you. We're just really sorry. We hate Trump more. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, okay, at least you're honest. You're right. an honest, you, you don't give a shit about anything but your tribe. And you're going to be honest about it. That deserves at least a modicum of respect. You're not pretending anymore. Good for you. Right. Be honest. So, okay, so let's say someone's 22 years old listening to this. They saw all of us grow up and have careers and success and, and, and so, you know, different degrees of success and break out and whatever. That's, that's over two a little bit. Like you have to plan it a little bit more carefully now. And, and to some extent, we've all predicted this, like the decline of corporatism. Yeah. And 
I'm not sure. I, I honestly think cancel culture shit's going to play itself out pretty quick. It will always be big with the large institutions that have to care. But like, um, uh, give it another six months. Once everybody's canceled, nobody's canceled. You know, it's like it's sort of like the table with one scratch is ruined. The table with a hundred scratches has character. Like me, like I was supposedly canceled, and like, come on, be serious. Like I run an eight-figure fucking company now. You know, and yeah, you can come after me. I guess the problem is that what I do is so valuable to so many people that like, uh, I, I like it, it, you're really gonna come after like. I, I, I could see it, I guess, if I decided to, to make that a thing. But like, uh, if I wanted to go to war over that, but I don't, I don't even care about getting these stupid culture wars because I think they're all dumb. If you're a young person right now, what I would do is deeply focus on skills. The yeah. world has completely opened up. There is an immense amount of opportunity and you have the ability to pick your lane and do anything. I would go do that. I would not get involved in the culture wars right now because that is, until there's a story or a movement that you feel like you can feel, you can act, that is life affirming, that you feel like you can follow, ignore it. And like, like the wokeism is not like life affirming. It's a death cult. It is guilt without repentance. That is a death cult. Like the thing about quote, Christianity actually. is, okay, yeah, original sin, that's real fucked up. But you can always get forgiveness, everybody in Christianity, which is why it's possibly one of the best stories ever told, right? It's still immensely powerful. There's a reason why, because redemption is baked in. Forgiveness is baked in. Are you ready to take control of your future and be your own boss? At Neighborly, we'll help you go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. As a Neighborly franchise owner, you'll join a community with thousands of passionate and experienced entrepreneurs. With 19 franchise brands providing a variety of home service needs, you'll benefit from decades of established systems and support. Learn more about Neighborly franchising by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com podcast.